Okay, so we're going to start talking about searching. And as the book says here, we're trying to find out whether an item is in a collection or not. And so you're going to have some sort of method that returns you a true or false. You give it a collection and an item to look for, gives you true or false, whether it's there or not. And very often you'll want to know where it is inside the list, not just that it's in the list, but in what position. So we're going to talk about, um, that's one of the all this mini lab that I, I have set up for, for you. So let's talk about searching. And the first one that they talk about is the sequential search. And honestly, there's not a lot to say about it. You start at the beginning of the collection, and then you go through them one at a time. And if it's the one that you are looking for, you return true. And if you get out of the entire loop and you still haven't find, found it, then you return false. Yeah. Turns out there is a way to do this without having to do an if and an extra return or an extra return in there. You can do it with a single while loop with a compound condition. If I have a little bit of time left over towards the end, I can come back and show you that. Okay, uh, this is boring and it's also order in. Okay, in worst case. And average, it's going to be N over, you're going to have to do N over two comparisons. And this is one thing that we're going to be talking about a lot when we get to sorting is how many things do I have to compare to one another? And also how many things do I have to change around it to get them in order? So it's comparisons and swaps. And for searching, we're concerned with the number of comparisons that are needed. So on the average, it's going to take N over two um, comparisons to find the thing that we're looking for. And again, worst case is always going to be N if the item's not present. And this also is the way, by the way, that we have to go through an, uh, a linked list. Now with an ordered sequential search, if everything is sorted into order, um, then you can exit early. So if you get to something that's larger than the thing you're looking for, you're finished. There's no need to go further because they're all in ascending order. So that's a nice little optimization if you know that your collection is in order, which we would have in an ordered linked list or an array that just happens to have everything in the correct order. That's order n. Can we do better than that? And the answer is yes, we can if we have a binary search. And a lot of people on the test, by the way, said the one way to optimize the search through a linked list, ordered linked list, was to use binary search. Unfortunately, with linked lists, that's not, not going to help you a lot because to, to find anything in a linked list, you have to traverse from the beginning anyway. Whereas with arrays or array lists, you can get to the an entry right away. It's an order one operation, but it's not an order one operation for linked lists. So a binary search is not what you want. What binary search says is, have you, how, are you all familiar with it? Or have, how many of you have used it before, by the way? Okay, since you haven't, um, the book shows this and it shows the code and I'm going to just give a better, I don't know if it's a better example, but I'm going to show the process of what's happening. So here we have a bunch of animal names and they're all in ascending order alphabetically. And we're trying to find the word dog to see if it's in the list. The trick is because we everything is in order, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the first and last index and then find the midpoint. Now, the question is, is dog above the midpoint or below the midpoint? Well, it's below the midpoint because dog comes before fox. That means that everything from fox onto the end is no longer a candidate. We don't have to look at them. We can eliminate half of the entries right away. Now let's look at what's left over, and we're going to put the last down at elk and recalculate our midpoint. And now we're going to still searching for dog. Is it bigger than cat or smaller than cat? The dog comes after cat in the dictionary. And that means we can immediately eliminate everything that's cat or below. So we've eliminated another half of the entries. That's why it's called a binary search, because you're dividing by two, the number of items you have to look at every time. So now we have only these two left over. And it turns out because we're using um, 
integer arithmetic, the midpoint and the first are going to be at the same place. And we found it. So once we find it at the midpoint, we're finished. So notice we didn't have to do a lot of comparison. We had to do only three comparisons. And in fact, how many, I was that one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. We will at most have to do four comparisons guaranteed because each time we're dividing in half. If I had a thousand elements and they were all in order, then I would only have to do 10 comparisons at most. 1,024, then down to 512, 256, 128, 64, 32, 16, 8, 4, 2, and 1. So this is much more efficient. If you know, again, once if you know everything is sorted already, this is an incredibly efficient thing to do. Now, the one thing that the book almost never shows of that or any books that I've ever seen, they don't show you, well, what happens if um, you're searching for something that isn't in the list? Okay. Oh, by the way, yeah, there it is. We found it. Hooray. So now let's look for something that isn't in the list. We're going to search for cow, which isn't in there. Okay. Again, the midpoint is fox, which means we can eliminate everything from fox onto the end. And now we recalculate our midpoint and last. And cow is larger than cat, which means we have to get rid of cat on downwards. And now we have dog and elk. And now we're going to do the same thing that we did. Cow is less than cat, which means we have to get rid of everything from dog on downwards, which means that the last is now going to be before the first. And when the last item is at the same as the first item or less, that means it's not there. So whenever the last item is less than the first item or equal to the first item, that's how you know that it's not in the list. And let me just go back here real quick. Um, few. One thing that I did not say explicitly, if you read the code, it's you'll see it explicitly. And that is, since I got rid of all this, the last is going to become the midpoint minus one. And the first will stay where it is. And here, because cat was eliminated, the first becomes the midpoint plus one. And in fact, if we were to look at the code, which I happen to have here, Okay. Yeah. This is um there is the code for it. So I said the first to midpoint point one or the last to midpoint minus one. And in fact, here I have something. This is a little bit better than the one in the book because the one in the book just looks for two items. This one I'm gonna let you type in numbers and it'll tell you whether it's there or not. Yeah. So if I want to say, is 13 in the list? Yes, it is. And you always want to test things at the limits. So is 47 in there and is one in there? I want to make sure that it catches the endpoints properly. But if I look for 48 or let's say 14, those aren't in the list. Um, what you may want to do, again, if you want to see the process in action, you might want to put in here, And you'll probably want to put it there after you've calculated the midpoint instead of before. So if you want to see the process actually happening, my suggestion is you take this code and make that happen. Okay, this is an iterative method. It's using a while loop. We can also do this recursively. And here's the recursive one that the book gives. And this is, again, the, the book has this sort of... I, 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 I don't know if it's conscious or not, but it has this bias against recursion. Because what it's saying is, all right, let's say that the item is less than the entry at the midpoint of the list. Then what we're going to do is we're going to copy everything up to the midpoint and do a recursive search on that half. Okay? Otherwise, it must be greater, and there we're going to copy the list 
from the midpoint plus one onto the end and put that in the right half and then do that. This makes the code incredibly inefficient because we're going to have to copy the array or half the array every time. And this again puts the idea in everybody said, oh, recursion really stinks. Okay. Well, no, this approach really stinks. There's a way to make this a lot easier. Instead of copying the whole damn list or half the damn list every time we are doing something. And this is one of the exercises in the book, but I'm going to just give you the answer here. What we're going to do is we're going to search the list for an item and we're going to tell where the beginning and end of the list is going to be, which part of it we want to examine. Now, instead of having to copy half the list, we need to give it the start and the midpoint and the new starting point and the new ending point. Then we can do a binary search for cursive. So if it's less than the element at the middle, search starting at the start of the array up to but not including the midpoint. Otherwise, we'll go through and do a recursive search starting one after the midpoint up to the end. And then we don't have to do any copying. So now we have a nice, elegant, recursive solution that is not horribly wasteful in terms of um, resources. Now, what is the big O uh, efficiency of this? The answer is, let's see if the book talks about this. <laughs> they better. Um, now this is a binary search. Dun, 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 dun. So it's order of log n, log to the base two of n, which is incredibly efficient. Okay. Now, even the recursive one, again, the, we all, oh, yeah, but what happens if you recurse too many times? Okay. For a thousand items, you still have to do recursion only 10 times. That's nothing. You'd have to have essentially much billions of items before your recursive search would blow out the stack. Okay. So the reason I'm harping on this recursion being a nice way of doing things is because when we get to sorting, we're going to see that recursion makes stuff really elegant. It's very easy to, well, I won't say easy. It makes it clearer to understand what's going on when you use a recursive algorithm. So Let's get over this thing about, oh, recursion is too expensive and it's too hard. No, recursion is just different and it can be tamed if you know what you're doing. And we know what we're doing. So there's your sequential search, which is order n, and your binary search, which is order um, log n. And the problem with binary search is that they, things have to be in order, but then that's why we have sorting, which is what we're going to be talking about next week. Um, the other way of finding whether something is in a collection or not is hashing. And that's a hash table. I think we talked about that earlier. Let me go over to here. Actually here. I guess I should make a new text document. Okay, so a hash table has keys and values, and um, accessing a hash table is an order one operation. Okay, namely, it takes the same amount of time, no matter how many items are in the hash table. So effectively, what we have with an array, for example, if I have an array, it's indexed by number. Okay. With a hash table, what we're going to have is we're going to have things like um, But instead of being indexed by number, they're going to be indexed by a key, such as California, Illinois, and New York. So that means I can say capital of New York 
and that will retrieve Albany for me. So it's like, it's a lookup table. If you've ever done spreadsheets with lookup tables, it's a lot like that. Now, setting these up is a little bit trickier than doing a simple array. But again, not that much trickier. So let's take a look at hash tables. And what we're going to do is we're going to have a function that's going to take a key and returns an index into a hash table slot. The way this is going to look is something like this. So let's do the states and capitals, I guess, as long as we're here. Um, so what I'm going to have, I'm going to have slot. I'm not sure. That, I'm not sure this is looking looking exactly the way I want it to look. Uh, let me let me see if I have something. Yeah. So, uh, shoot. I don't have a good diagram here. Also, these do not belong here. So, let me edit this real quick. Let me pause the recording. Here's the idea. For a hash table, we're going to have a bunch of slots that are numerically ordered, like an array or an array list. And that's what's going to be providing our hash table. That's what's going to be underneath this whole business. What we're going to do is every time we get a key, we're going to take that key and convert it into a number. And that's going to be the number of the slot where we're going to put the value. So for example, let me move this to the side. If I have, let's say, California, that might convert to the number three. New York might convert to the number seven, and um, Illinois might convert to the number two. Okay. So we have some function that takes our key and gives us a slot number. Then I'm going to put the value in here. So Sacramento goes here in slot three. In slot um, seven, I'm going to put the value, which is going to be Albany. And in slot two, I'm going to put the key, the value for Illinois, which is Springfield. Now, when somebody wants to look something up and they say, okay, what's the capital of Illinois? They enter Illinois. I do this same hashing function and get slot two and go directly to slot two and pick up Springfield. And there's my answer for them. Clever, huh? And if they type in New York, that moves to slot seven and I give them Albany. Um, now, if they give something that's not in the table, then I'll find a null there in the slot number. Okay, that's that's the theoretical thing that's going good is going on here. So we want a function that takes a key and returns an index into the hash table slot. And if we have integers as keys, which is the example they give in the book, we could use a modulo. So we'll just take whatever the number is that you want and we're going to Take that key, mod the number of slots, and that'll tell us which slot number we're in. So now, unfortunately, I've got to undo this. Excuse me. I must not have saved this earlier. Don't worry, when I upload this later, I'll clean out all that junk that I have in there. So for example, 54 is going to go to slot 10 because we have 11 slots and 54 mod 11 is 10. 26 will go to slot 4. And when we have all of our numbers, 54, 26, 93, 17, 77, and 31, this is where they're all going to end up. 
So if I want to find out, hey, is 93 in there? I take 93 mod 11 um, and look in there and see, yes, it's there. Well, this is great. There's another way we can do this, by the way. Modulo is one way to do it. Another way is to use folding. What we'll do is, for example, let's say I had the number 4327. What I'd do is I'd take the first two digits, add the last two digits, which is 70, and then I'd go modulo number of slots. So that's yet another way that we can find a hash function for an integer key. Or we can use the mid-square method. Namely, take the number, square it, and then take the middle two digits, and then use that mod and slots. And, and each of these has an advantages in terms of spreading things out nicely okay, versus ease of calculations. Modulo is the easiest one to calculate. This one's a little bit harder to calculate, and this one's a fairly expensive operation. But it may have a better characteristic of spreading things out throughout the slots. What about strings? What if I want to put strings in a uh, hash table? One way to do it is to add the character values. So I take the capital J, which is ASCII number 74. A is 97. V is 118. And lowercase a is 97. That adds up to 386. And I use that as my number to modulo into the, my slots. Now, the problem with that is that AVA capital J will also map to the same number. So what some people do is, okay, we'll use weighted character values. We'll take the position number and multiply that by the value. So I'll have 74 times 1 plus 97 times 2, and then 118 times 3 and 97 times 4, and that gives us a different number. And then if things are in a different order, we'll get different um, results even though they have the same characters. So this is the kind of hash function that you have for strings. If I wanted to store strings in a hash table. Now, we then come to a problem of collisions. So far, so good. We've got 11 slots. Okay. So now I want to add 44, 55, and 20. Okay. Well, the problem is 44 mod 11 is zero. But slot zero is already filled. So one way of resolving this collision is to go to the next open slot. And the next open slot is slot number one. And so 44 would go there. 55 mod 11 was zero. Slot zero is filled, so we have to go to mod 44. 44 is filled, so we have to go on to 55. Uh, to slot two, excuse me. And that's where the 55 goes. Um, the advantage of linear probing is that it's very straightforward to understand. And it's also pretty straightforward to implement. And let's look for 20. 20 mod 11 is 9. That means we go to the next one, but 10 is already filled. We have to wrap around to 0. Yeah, let's go. So 20 would go here. But that isn't there. Therefore, we have to go to 54. Then we have to go back to the zero. That's filled, that's filled, that's filled. And we finally find an empty space at slot number three. And this means also, by the way, that when we are going to be accessing one, we want to find out, is 20 in there? We have to go there. And if we don't find it immediately, we also have to do this linear probing. So it's not exactly order of one. In a perfect world, where we had something called a perfect hash function, And that is a perfect hash function, namely um, every distinct key um, hashes to a unique slot number. Then there would be no collisions. So for example, if I had the number zero through 99 and I had a hundred slots, well, I'd have it made because hey, there would be no collisions. So again, we have to be able to avoid these collisions, and one way to do it is with this linear probing method. But that's going to slow us down. We're not going to be exactly order of one. Because once we get to a slot, if that's not the one that we want, we're going to have to do the linear probing ourselves.
what other ways are there to do collision resolution? The only problem with linear probing, although it again, it's nice and fast to implement, is that you have clustering. So you get like this 77, 44, and 45 that tend to cluster together. Other ways to do it are plus n. So instead of skipping to the next slot, we'll call rehashing, we'll add a skip amount. So we'll maybe go three slots down and then do mod size of the underlying array. And that tends to break up the um, clustering. And it's also not very expensive to do this operation. By the way, the, the when we were linear probing, probing is plus one. Just add one. There's a quadratic probing where your new hash becomes with your current position. Every time you take another hash, you add one to I. So you'll go to position plus one, then position plus four, then position plus nine, then position plus 16, and then you'll try position plus 25. Again, all mod the size. And that also tends to avoid having things cluster together. But again, this is a little bit more expensive to calculate. There's also chaining. And this is the thing that we're going to be doing on the assignment. The assignment's going to do chaining, where we're going to have, um, let's say I have 11 slots in these numbers. And what we do is this, 54. Each one of these slots is now going to be a reference to an array list that has all the candidates that map to that particular value. So when I add 44, it goes after 77. 55 goes into the list at slot number one. So now instead of single entries, we have a, each entry in the table is a list of candidates. And we can use a sequential search to go through them. So we have order one to get our initial slot. And then we can go through here and find out how it the 20 is right there. Notice the, remember the 20 where on the linear program, we had to go like five steps to find a, an open slot. Now there's no problem doing it. So this is called chaining. And that is what we're going to be implementing in the assignment. So that takes us through hashing. Um, new topic. Okay, there's something I want to tell you. This is has nothing to do with data structures, but it has to do with the class. This is about the time of the semester when when you go to your um, grades. Oh, let's see. Where was this here? Um, yes. You will probably want to turn this off where it says calculate based only on graded assignments. Because you'll notice here it says I have a total of 100%, but I'm missing almost everything. So, so happens I did one thing very, very well. If I turn this off, um then you will see that my total here is I really have only 6.98% of my score. At the beginning of the semester, you don't want this turned off because it'll totally demoralize you. Even though you get a perfect score, you've only got 1% of the, all the points possible. Well, great, okay. But now we're coming closer to the end of the semester and you really want to turn this off so you can see a better idea of what your true percentage is. So please be aware of this. These things, by the way, this 100% here is um, what the weights are. Okay, and it's automatically doing all those calculations for you. And again, here in the grading, you can also put in different scores of your own. So if you want to you know, predict, okay, gee, I wonder what I think I'm going to be doing on the final exam out of 100, and you can see how that affects your grade. But again, right about now is when you want this off. Turning it off the week before things end is also the equal shock. Like, oh, crap, I had no idea I was missing all those assignments. The problem that I'm having with this, 
Right now, we've got this hash table with this empty slots, and we're simply putting only values in there. We just want to see if a value is in the table. Okay. We don't have a key and value here. All we have is values, and that's the approach they used here. Oh, by the way, this is important also. The load factor, namely, is how many items do I have divided by the table size? So how, how full is my um, hash table? And, and performance gets worse the higher the table gets loaded because of the collisions. Uh, this talks about folding, square method. So in order to make things pretty straightforward here, what they did on their hash table, oh, this is not the one I want. I want the one from here. So let's look at the implementation of the hash table that they use. So we're going to have um, an integer number of slots and the string is going to be data. So we're going to have a hash table that's going to take numbers and strings, apparently, here. Let's see what I've got on the test here. Yeah. Oh, wow. This is different than what they did. OK. So I did not copy what the book did, apparently. Should we look at what the book says? Do you want me to look at, let's, yeah, let's look at their hash table implementation. I think this is a good, good thing to do. Oh no, they did this. They do have a key and value. Okay, so they, this is, they, they went further along. Okay, they did a, a key and value. This is fine. So we're going to have a key and value and, Great. So we're going to have the slots and we're going to have strings with the data. Okay. Didn't think that was in the book, but there it is. So we're going to have slots, which are going to have our integers, and this is going to be the data associated with each integer. So if we're going to take integers as our keys and our data is going to be the strings that are associated with those keys. In the test here, so 54 is associated with cat, 26 is the key, and that's that. And 55, so this may be you know, how many animals you have in your zoo, of each of each you have in your zoo, I don't know. This is a weird example. But, but let's, go, let's just go with it. This two string shows what's in the table. And the question is, okay, how do I put things in there? I'm going to take my key and I'm going to figure out what does that, which slot number is that going to go into? And I'm going to use modulo for this. So you give me an integer that's going to be the key and I'm going to tell you which slot it belongs in by doing mod. And if there's nothing in that slot already, cool. We'll put the key in there, and in the corresponding data array, we're going to put the value. Well, what if it's not, if, if it isn't null? That means there's somebody already occupying that slot. So what we're going to do is we're going to rehash, starting at this slot, and we're going to use, again, the length of our table. And then that's going to give the next slot that we're going to try. And as long as we don't have an empty slot, and it isn't the key that we're looking for, then we're going to have to go and try yet again the next one. And here's our rehash function where we're going to add one and go on to the next. Notice that this is very nice. The way I did this is because now I can replace this hash function with something, let's say, like the, um, oh, I don't know, the folding. Or I could use the squaring and taking the middle digits of that. And here for rehash, I could make it a skip of more than one, and I can make it a quadratic if I wanted to. OK. 
Okay, that's why I made these as separate. That's why the that I and the book made these as separate methods. So again, if we find a slot that is already unoccupied, congratulations, we win. Otherwise, we have to keep rehashing until we either find the key that we were looking for or we found an empty slot. If we found an empty slot, then we need to put in the key and the value. If we found the key that we were looking for, then we're changing the value. That allows us to put a key twice. When I put a, so if I were to say put of 26 um, yield, okay? And then I said, oh no, you know, I want a different value. 26 should be associated with um, giraffe. So it would find the 26 in our table and associate that with giraffe instead of eel. And so that's, that's how you do a hash table. You're looking for an empty slot. If you find it, you put in the key and value. If the slot isn't empty, you keep hashing and rehashing until you find either the thing you're looking for or you find an empty slot. And then here's get. I'm going to give you a key and I need to know what that's associated with. So here's my starting slot, which is going to be the hash function. I'm going to hash it once and there's going to be my position. As long as it's not equal to null, if I forget a null, that means it's not in the table. If this was the key that I was looking for, great, I'll return that. The, the value. Otherwise, I'll rehash and... If the position is the starting slot, then I return null. So if I've rehashed all the way and I get back to where I started, then it's not there. I keep doing this as long as I either have um, non-nulls or I found the thing I want. And then I'll either return the data or I'll return a null. And so here's our test program here. So for example, 20 was associated with chicken. And so if I, my key is 20, I should get chicken, tiger, and 99 is not in the table, so I should get null. And then I can change 20 from referring to chickens. The value for 20 will be duck. And let's go here. And in fact, there it is. And it shows, by the way, um, the slot numbers there, the slots there. So there's my hash table. It shows every slot. And I had two empty slots in here. Yeah. This is a fairly good place to stop right now. It says this in the book, and I have to find it here. Uh, yeah, there's one thing I need to add here. Okay, I'm not sure where it says it on this page, but it says making this generic so that we could have any sort of key and any sort of value is a little bit more complex. That's the reason they did this particular example where they have an integer for the key and a string for the data because it's fairly clear which one is which and how things get looked up. 
What I'm going to do on Wednesday is I'm going to go through hash table again, but this time I'm going to use a lot of the same code, but we're going to make it generic. The reason I'm doing this is, first of all, it's more useful that way. And second, it's a lot like what the assignment is. So it's going to, what we're going to do on Wednesday is going to give you a lot of clues for the assignment. And for doing this assignment, we're going to have to depend on something that Java has for us. Now, right now, what I did with the hash code was I hash function was I did modulo and I could do folding. And for strings, you can, you know, add up the characters by their position weights. Well, what about some other weird object type in Java? How are you going to get a hash code for that? Like a double, how do you do a hash code for a double? That's, that's a really good question. And the answer is, don't worry about it. Because it turns out that Java has a built-in method called hash code that every object has associated with it. So you call the hash code method with an object and it will give you back an integer. It could be a negative number, by the way. Okay, so you got to be careful about that. But it'll give you some integer. And the object objective of it is to give you as good a hashing as possible. In fact, let me look this up and show you what it says here. Um, yeah. So here's the hash code method. Yeah. And by the way, they use it so you can build hash maps really easily. Yeah. So if you invoke it on the same object more than once during the execution of an application, it must return the same integer. Yeah. If two objects are equal according to the equals method, then they must produce the same integer result. So these are guarantees that when you use the built-in hash code method, it's not going to do really bizarre crap on you. Now, this is interesting. It's not required that if two objects are unequal, then calling the hash code must produce distinct integer results. Okay. It says right here, as far as it can possibly do it, hash code will return distinct integers for distinct objects. So it might give you back some collisions. Okay. Oh, well, we're going to have to live with that. But hash code does its very best to make sure that you... Um, have something that is as unique as possible. In fact, the question is, what does strings do? I looked this up because I don't know, how do they do strings anyway? And it turns out that their hash code method takes the first character times 31 to the n minus 1, where there are n characters in the string plus the first, next character times 31 to the n minus 2, all the way down to s sub n minus 1, and they add all those together. And you say, oh my god, isn't it horrible having to take all of this stuff? And the answer is no, they can use um, what's called bit manipulation to get this really easily. They don't have to do a lot of multiplication to make this happen. Um, so sometimes they will tell you what their hash code method is. I don't know, double, let's see what it is. Oh, okay. That's interesting. So if you are deeply wondering about how Java decides to make hash codes for various objects, you can look it up and it'll tell you what the definitions are. And that's only if you're incredibly curious about it. Most of the time you say, Yo, I'll take whatever they give me. Okay. And hash code is designed to do a really good job. So that is that for what we want to talk about. And that was, ooh, I'm going to have to edit this. Okay. Namely, we have this uh, examples of sequential binary search returning a Boolean, and now we'd like to know where it is. So here are these three sequential search example, binary search example, and the recursive binary search that doesn't do all the copying. 
And you'll want to modify those programs so they return an integer that tells where the item was found or negative one if the item is not in the collection. So that's something that you can look at and do during um, lab today. Or if you want to look ahead at the assignment and start on that, that would be cool also. And let me stop recording.